You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, episode 23, sonnet 22. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say, say I'm not just another one at your place? Your place? You're, You're the, the pretender. pretender. What, what if I say I will never surrender? Will never surrender? During the past week, I received some feedback regarding the podcast format, for which I'm very grateful. And as of this week, I will begin each podcast with a reading of the complete sonnet before diving into the analysis. Once again, I'd like to thank my patrons for their contributions, and as importantly, for showing faith in a project I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. If you haven't already, then please sign up to support the graphic novel adaptation at www.patreon.com slash fisherking. Every dollar helps breed a page that brings us closer to a graphic novel that will make the sonnets so much more accessible. And of course, ten times that dollar will bring you the finished product ten times faster. Shakespeare'sSonnets.com has a lengthy comment for sonnet number 22 discussing the significance of the sonnets that are numbered as multiples of 11. And while I'm sure that that's correct, I haven't yet seen how the number 22 fits in. What is certain though, is that this sonnet is fully readable as being addressed to Shakespeare, to the sonnet, and to the reader. My glass shall not persuade me I am old, so long as youth and thou are of one date. But when in thee time's furrows I behold, then look I death my days should expiate. For all that beauty that doth cover thee is but the seemly raiment of my heart, which in thy breast doth live as thine in me, how can I then be elder than thou art? O oh, therefore, love, be of thyself so weary, as I not for myself, but for thee will, bearing thy heart, which I will keep so cheery, as tender nurse her babe from faring ill. Presume not on thy heart when mine is slain. Thou gavest me thine, not to give back again. Right. Let's analyze Sonnet 22. My glass shall not persuade me I am old, so long as youth and thou are of one date. But when in thee time's furrows I behold, then look I death my days should expiate. My glass, throughout the sequence, is the looking glass that reflects, and Shakespeare and his sonnets both see the other as being on the reflected side of it. Through the glass of the sonnets, the reader can see Shakespeare's reflection, while the sonnets see the reader both on his behalf and through the reader's own eyes. Persuade means bring over by talking. Youth may or may not be a pun meaning Eunice. Date seems like it might be interesting, but it's not clear if the Old French still carried meaning from its Latin origin to give, grant, or offer. Furrows was written F-O-R-R-W-E-S, furrows, in the original text. And while I'm a hard sell that furrows was the only way it was meant to be read, I so far haven't found any fitting alternatives myself. Expiate, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, meant to extinguish or bring to a close. According to the online Oxford and Etymology Dictionaries, it meant atone for or make amends. Then look I death. In the Arden sonnets, this is translated to, then I anticipate death. But I think the word look here is important, and whoever is speaking is not simply anticipating death, but looking at death's reflection. They are both seeing an image and seeing themselves reflected as they look or appear. Look to, even today, meant see to or be sure to. And combined with the word should, this becomes a conditional instruction to Shakespeare or the sonnet, if I see you in time's furrows, then I should ensure that death expiates my days, or that my days expiate my death. I had to read that line quite a few times before I realized that the order of the words death and my days is actually ambiguous. For Shakespeare, this opening quatrain is saying that he will not be discouraged by his physical mirror as long as his youth is still reflected in the sonnet. But when he sees the passage of time in the lines of the sonnet's text and his old age before him, then he is compelled to ensure that his death and legacy will make amends for his life. For the sonnet speaking to Shakespeare, Shakespeare's age will not affect him as long as Shakespeare and the youth captured in the sonnet 
were born on the same day. But when the sonnet witnesses Shakespeare aging, it is compelled to ensure that its days will atone for the bard's death. When the reader is addressed, then the youth and the reader will no longer be of one date. At this point, the sonnet's days, when the book is open and the reader is reading it, must be used to atone for Shakespeare's death as effectively as possible. For all that beauty that doth cover thee is but the seemly raiment of my heart, which in thy breast doth live as thine in me. How can I then be elder than thou art? While raiment was a word for dress, it was derived from the old French array, which meant order, position, arrangement, sequence, as well as rank or line of soldiers. The sonnet sequence is an array that clothes Shakespeare's embedded spirit, and there's also a reference to the lines of verse in military terms that recalls the trenches from Sonnet 2 and sap from Sonnet 5. It's also possible that there's a pun intended on the word ray, as in rays of the sun. The phrasing of the two lines, the seemly raiment of my heart, which in thy breast doth live, is ambiguous. We can read it as stating that the beauty, or raiment, is what lives in thy breast, or that the heart covered by the raiment is what lives there. Either meaning works well. Art, as before, can be read both in the modernized sense of R, a state of being, but also as art, where the sonnet being addressed is art that Shakespeare has produced, or where art is the verb for the act of Shakespeare producing it. When addressed from Shakespeare to the sonnet, the second quatrain is saying that for all the beautiful words that Shakespeare has invested in the sonnet, they are only words forming the outer appearance of his spirit, as Shakespeare's spirit itself lives on in the sonnet's breast, as it does in him. How can Shakespeare be any older than the sonnet or the youth captured in it? When addressed to Shakespeare, the sonnet is saying that all the beauty that Shakespeare has, and remember, Shakespeare is playing the role of Narcissus, it's only the surface of what the sonnet and Shakespeare truly share, his spirit. The sonnet questions how it could be older than Shakespeare, and while it's strange to think about, if we look at the sonnet as a snapshot in time, and Shakespeare's being in the present during his reading of the sonnet, then even mere moments after Shakespeare had written the sonnet, it would already have been older than him, in the sense that it would be of a previous time. When addressed to the reader, we can imagine the sonnet covering the reader with its beauty while it is being read, and that it is the beauty and Shakespeare's spirit that live in the sonnets and the reader's hearts. Even though this sonnet, especially nowadays, is considerably older than the reader, they will be of one date for the duration of the reading experience. O oh, therefore, love, be of thyself so wary, as I not for myself, but for thee will, bearing thy heart which I will keep so cheery, as tender nurse her babe from faring ill. Will, as usual in the sonnet sequence, is ambiguous, both meaning, I will for thee be wary, and also, as I will be for thee, William. Cheery meant sorrowful, full of care, and careful. The words bearing and faring ill recall the established sailing theme. Heart, in this context, is a metaphor for soul, love, and spirit. Shakespeare is cognizant of the fact that we tend to be a lot more compassionate towards others than we are towards ourselves, even more so towards people that we care about. In the third quatrain, Shakespeare tells the sonnet, his love, to take care of itself in a way that Shakespeare cares not for himself, but for the sonnet. The sonnet bears its heart, which Shakespeare will keep from misfortune, presumably through his art. The sonnet, meanwhile, is wary not for its own sake, but for Shakespeare's. The sonnet bears Shakespeare's heart and keeps it carefully. The reader is instructed to be wary. The sonnet does not care for itself, but for the reader and will, its creator. It's even possible to read from this that the sonnet also wills or becomes William for the reader. When the sonnet tells the reader that it is bearing the reader's heart, it is positioning the reader as a passenger, and the reader's heart is borne by the sonnet on this journey through the sequence. Presume not on thy heart when mine is slain, thou gavest me thine not to give back again. Presume meant to take upon oneself, to take liberty, to take for granted, and to presuppose. 
Slain meant to smite, strike, or beat. If the last meaning was intended, then this might be a reference to a beating heart, or beating a drum in the sense of the established musical theme. Shakespeare gave his heart to the sonnet to carry, and if the sonnet ever ceases to be read, Shakespeare will not get it back again. The sonnet must not take its heart for granted once Shakespeare stops beating. The sonnets are duty-bound, contracted to Shakespeare, and cannot go back on their obligation to their creator. For the reader, presume not on thy heart when mine is slain, may be read as, don't take your heart for granted, let my heart's failure be a lesson to you. Once the reader has given the sonnets their heart, or let the sonnets into their heart, there will be no going back. Shakespeare's heart beat until his death. The sonnet's heart repeats Shakespeare's beats whenever it is read. And the reader's soul, once inspired by the sonnets, will forever remain imprinted with the spirit of the bard. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording this podcast, converting these podcast episodes into a book, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. Once again, I need your help to make this happen. Please consider signing up to support this project at www.patreon.com slash fisherking. Keep up with the graphic novel progress at sonnetcomics.com and join our community discussions on Reddit at slash r slash sonnetcomics with an X. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not no, like I'm the yet. others? What if I say I'm not just another no, one in your place? place? You're the pretender. What if I say I will never surrender?